Hey, everyone. Welcome to the That's Allowed podcast. I'm your hostess, Dr. Adrienne McKeon, and today we have Dorothe Wires Lucci. Welcome. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Adrienne, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It is lovely to have you here. I'm so pleased that you said yes to my invitation to come on the podcast. I think uh, your work is just so exciting. So please tell the audience a little bit about the amazing work that you do. Um, well, um, oh, I wouldn't even know where to start, but um, <laughs> I, I guess I can start with what, what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah. So my, my work uh, alternates between um, different areas, which I enjoy all of them very much. And I think what is appealing to me is is being able to work in all of them uh, simultaneously. So one of them is research. Um, so I've been working with immersive uh, experiences and how um, they support transformation and that's digital and non-digital immersive experiences. Um, then the other is teaching. So I'm a um, professor for uh, transpersonal psychology and psychology um, at Sophia University. And um, the areas I teach in are, you know, wide. Um, right now it's perception and cognition, which I love. Um, so I'm very much interested in whole person education um and multi-sensory education and play like we were just talking about before yeah. and the ability to integrate information through contemplative practices so that's another thing I forgot to mention with uh, the immersive experiences I spend a lot of time um working with contemplative practices and how to integrate contemplation um, so that people can um, really digest information in a whole, in a holistic manner. I mean, what does that mean? Well, like, you know, the whole body, not just the brain, so that they're able to interact with information and use it um, for discernment. Um, so that is research, teaching, a practitioner. So I'm, I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, um, but I use many variations. I'm a mindfulness coach. Um, I love uh, interpersonal neurobiology, neuroscience, whatever I can get my hands on, uh, somatic integration, art expression, neuroesthetics. The list is long. Um, I have a special passion too for um, people who are fighting cancer. Mm -hmm. So I do support groups um, for uh, cancer and um, cancer patients, cancer survivors, metastatic, uh, the works. And I also have a private practice um, for people. Um, and that's using the same type of methodologies I was just talking about. Um, and then, um, yeah, I've been working in, in the tech area, but that's really just because. <laughs> um, <laughs> I noticed that people were having a really hard time um, finding a place of peace and tranquility when they first start meditating. Uh, and I was concerned about that because I was working primarily with anxiety and depression. And I noticed that people um, would come and then com come back, you know, every time with sort of the same issues slightly differently and they'd get a little better. But sometimes it would get really difficult for them to do these things independently, uh, like sit and meditate independently. Um so I was like, you know, how can we hack this? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, and how can we make it easier for people when they sit down on a pillow, when they're meeting themselves, essentially to not run away and go, well, you know, <laughs> that was great. But, you know, meditation is not for me or what a bunch of garbage because, you know, I got out more nervous than I went in. Right. Um, and so then I started looking at technology, what different 
you know, tools are available there, methodologies to, to work with it and integrating um, some neuroscience and movements and play um, with my first a project that was a way back, well, way back. I think it was 2013, it's not that way back, but <laughs> seems like way back. Um, with a project called Worry Bubble, where you would you would have these bubbles come out um, with an app on the apps, Apple Store. Uh, you'd have these bubbles come out and you would put your worries in and then you would pop them and put more worries in and pop them and pop them and pop them. And just alone that movement and the eye hand coordination and the thought you were releasing every time. Um, and then there was a little meditation with that. So that was a simpler thing. And then I was like, but, you know, this problem of meeting yourself um, in meditation alone was still remaining. So what to do about that? So then I found virtual reality to be the appropriate um, solution. <laughs> I mean, like, what could be better? Uh, totally immersive. Uh, what if you played with it in a way that would bring people down um, and, you know, just lean more into their own silence that is there for them to access by presenting it to them on the outside. And so it's a um, very simple app I created, Starflight VR, which um, had... A, um, a sound of a heartbeat at rest that then had stars and you're flying through the stars and there was some color therapy or there is some color therapy, it's still available. Um, and uh, so this movement then starts, of course, entrancing people, but enables them to let go of the thoughts. Um, because notice, especially with people who haven't used VR a lot, <laughs> The VR cuts the thought. I think when you once you've been in virtual reality beyond a certain amount of time, it doesn't do that so much anymore. Um, but at the beginning, it definitely does. So then I started using that for research. Uh, and I went on and created another app, Flow for Breath VR, which was more about attuning to breathing and different types of breathing. And what if we added visuals to it? And you could sort of decide on your own rhythm. Um, and now I've been experimenting with, you know, what other tools can we put out there that are easy for people to, um, to use? Because virtual reality, although I think it is the most effective one, is also a bit more difficult um, because you have to buy the headset. Yeah. And um, it turns out that at the beginning, when I first came out with this, it was the phone and the headset and the whole gear. People were getting so nervous putting that all together that they were <laughs> more nervous, at, you know. And then the technology got better so they could just strap on a headset, but then they had to buy the headset and that was like more expensive. So anyways, it, um, it's been a conversation uh, with the technology, with the hardware, with the software, with the ability to um, people to, to interact with it. Um, but I did some more research and there got very transpersonal and found that um, people were having experiences of meta-awareness um, with the virtual reality. Uh, and that was specifically uh, about death awareness. I was, I've been working with death awareness. So that's another one of of my favorite areas. <laughs> well, you know, it so, turns out that death and life are so similar. Absolutely, and I'm I'm very interested in this idea of immersive experiences. You say digital and non digital. So a digital immersive experience, as you described, would be you have got the you know the headset on. Yeah. What is a non digital immersive experience? Okay, so there's a um, project that Dr. Marilyn Schlitz um, at Sophia University and I have been working on for a little while now um, about grief. And what 
is great about that one, I have to say, Dr. Flitz is the PI for this. Um, and uh, what, what we set up was a room called a psychomantium. Hmm. And um, there was a tradition at uh, Sophia University, which was the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology before, um, of psychomantium. So like, what is a psychomantium? It's basically a room, a dark room that you go into and uh, it's totally dark. <laughs> and then you sit down and you have a candle behind you and a mirror in front of you. Mm. And then you have a meditation period of about 35 minutes um, where you sit in this room and you basically the only thing that you can see is you don't see your own reflection. You just see the candle, the reflection mm -hmm. of the candle. And we asked people to think about somebody that had that they missed that had, you know, passed away for them where they felt like things weren't resolved, like there was something left. And, yeah. you know, where there was this active grief that kind of sits and uh, can be very difficult for people to work through. And so um, people would come in and sit in this chamber and uh, and then stare at the mirror and there was a, a induction beforehand and you know for research purposes they fill out questionnaires before and after and then there's also an interview um so but the psycho mansion was proved to be really effective right but you can't always have this perfect setup because the perfect setup is that it's really dark so there's yeah. another um psychologist who does this um called dr moody he's on the east coast and he's been practicing this for a long time and he uses that for grief uh, and he has a very elaborate um, routine or, or setup to like get people to relax like he goes on a walk with them beforehand and they talk about the person and then he shows them into the room and so um, that's an immersive experience that is non-digital totally non-digital um, and, and I would say that there is a lot of them like so mm -hmm. if you would go into the forest like forest bathing like this yeah. you know concept of going into the forest and sitting there and just letting um, the trees you know around you uh, be your immersive experience um, if you target it that way that can be something um, that is very powerful and so I would count anything like that as an immersive experience but I mean we could really start going crazy with this in the sense sure. that you know like well, what is reality, right? Mm -hmm. So we're using virtual reality to create a certain scenario because it's easier to use that. Um, so people are fully immersed. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. Like, I mean, by the time you've finished creating a forest in virtual reality, you might as well go and sit in, in a real one. If you can. <laughs> yeah, if you and can. Not everybody can. So <laughs> flight through the stars is a little bit more well, we don't get to do that. So, sure, you know, let, let's go out on the limb and, and play a little bit. And, um, and this idea, so we, and, and we also made a um, comparison group for uh, the psychomantium that is in virtual reality. So in other words, you sit down and you have the experience of walking into a room and then you have the same thing, but it's a little bit more, there's a little bit more out of body experience and floating above and into the mirror and back out just because mm -hmm. you can. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but then what is reality, right? Reality is really like what we perceive. So whatever is immersive, I mean, I could say that, you know, just sitting here with you right now is an immersive experience. Sure. So I'm very interested in ritual as a theater nerd. I think this is, you know, a big topic for me is ritual and how we can use these external rituals and 
productions, performances to act out things that are going on inside or that we want to go on inside. So where do you see the crossover between these immersive experiences and rituals? Mm. Everywhere. (laughs) 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 Um. Well, for one, what's interesting about a ritual is that it, it holds you. So it depends if we have rituals that we expect, uh, like daily rituals, you know, mm-hmm. like a cup of tea or a cup of coffee in the morning or um, whatever different people do to get started in their day. That's a ritual, right? So that gives people a sense of safety and a sense of place um beyond obviously their boost of caffeine you know that's needed in the morning to maybe you know get going um so there's a sense of holding and in terms of immersive i would say that ritual can strengthen the sense of place and holding um in wherever we are um and there's so many different types of rituals. And sometimes maybe we don't even see them as such. Like we take it for granted. Like people don't really think about, you know, necessarily about their cup of coffee in the morning as being a ritual. Um, and, you know, or reading a story before putting your kids to bed at night that's so simple right but it's such a ritual Mm -hmm. and um that can enable the kids for example to really dive into their story when the story becomes immersive again so it deepens that connection between i think probably the parents and and the kids but also the kids to the story and um later on maybe they're reading their own stories at night Uh, or listening to their own story and then so that's a ritual that continues and um it deepens the experience in that way and then we have like more you know rituals of what we think of of rituals like um uh, change of the seasons or christmas or um thanksgiving or um new year's And, and you know, every culture will have a different way to recognize transformation and change, whether it's through the calendar year. And again, it's, I think that, yeah, that deepens that immersive effect. And like, why would we care? I mean, I, that could be your next question. I would say like, why would we even care if it's immersive or not? Like, you know, what's to it, right? Well, I think it's, it deepens our appreciation for life. Uh, and it lets us taste the moment. So from a mindfulness perspective, that's where it's at, right? Like you want to be in the present moment. So it calls you into the present moment. It invites you in. And maybe you get to notice things that you forgot, but because you're so used to doing this, you can really um, like go into it. You know, there's also this thing, um, this researcher called Porges. Um, he has the polyvagal theory, right? So it's about the vagal nerve that runs mm-hmm. along and it's really uh, responsible for switching the um, sympathetic into the parasympathetic. What does that mean? Like basically when you're in a stress state, how to switch over to a non-stress state. And this relaxation that comes with it can really be brought about through ritual, right? So in in a lot of the uh, world religions, you have these actions of standing up, sitting down, um, or praying. I mean, I grew up Catholic, so we had to like stand up, sit down, kneel, stand up, sit down, kneel, like in church the whole entire time. And, um, you know, turns out that that's great for um, getting your system into a parasympathetic mode. And so for the Muslims, you know, it is the praying um, towards Mecca. And I mean, we can go on and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's also a ritual. And that's also immersive. And that also brings you back into into your body. It brings you back into, I want to say this reality. Maybe Mm -hmm. people would 
fight me about that because they'd say like you know it's not this reality you're like you're doing something else like you're not interacting but it's deepening your sense of reality uh, mm -hmm. in the present moment and therefore you can be more attentive to what is yeah okay, that was a long answer that's a great answer. It's I, it's just so funny. I'm looking at the time and realizing I haven't even asked my first question yet. So <laughs> it's great. This is great. Sorry, I love sorry. it. <clears throat> so the, the question that I usually start with, and we'll just throw it in here and see what happens, is what story is the world not getting? Um, huh. Maybe that it's so simple. Hmm. Yeah, I, we try to find all these really complicated answers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Boy, do we. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it's so simple, right? It's really about being in the present moment and paying attention. Um, and then we can't be anymore if we're so engrossed in so many complicated things. I mean, nothing again, you know, I mean, I love like i said i love research so obviously you know there's a part of me that totally enjoys complications too um <laughs> but for the essential things like quality of life like really um living your life to the fullest i think that we're not getting the fact that it's so simple Do you think there's a difference between complexity and complication? For sure. For sure. And, and I think, and I'm not saying that there is no complexity, because in that simplicity, there's all the complexity. Yeah. So that's the catch. <laughs> there's a catch. That's a catch. Um, but the complications actually lead us away from understanding the complexity through the simplicity. So then we're running amok somewhere. Um, yeah, absolutely. So where does where does the story of discovering this begin for you? Hmm. The simplicity. Yeah, recognizing that the the answer is be in the present moment, be here now. Yeah, that's that that's so interesting because a lot of you know I I'd say I was really busy you know making it complicated for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> Ooh, um, huh. I think the truth is though somewhere along the line, whenever I've been in nature. I've always felt very connected to the simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, going back to nature or my time spent in nature has kept me sane throughout, you know, any crises and horrible things that, you know, have happened in my life. Uh, you know, uh, things that I've had to surmount. Um, yeah. And if I wouldn't have had that, poof, I don't know. So maybe I would have gotten totally lost in the complications, but this way, you know, I, I've always taken the breathing time, but I think that that's when it was really clear to me. is um the ocean sound yeah so That's you just question. reminded me of a story that i haven't thought about in years would you mind if i take a moment to share this no go ahead so it's so funny because before we pushed record we were actually discussing that we had both lived in geneva switzerland yeah yeah now when i was living there I had this pretty traumatic experience where I was at the parkour, you know, there's the little place where there's all these little exercise stations and you go around, you do the little exercises and you, you know, mm. run around the park. And I was there very early in the morning as was my want. And this man 
kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, he'd been following me sort of, I could sort of see in, you know, in, in my peripheral vision that he'd been kind of following me around, yeah. but then he suddenly sort of jumped out and grabbed me by the crotch. And I was holding this little log, you know, I was doing little squats. And so I just hit him with it yeah. as as and took off running. And I ended up running all the way down to the water. And, you know, there's that place where the two rivers meet, mm -hmm. the Rhone and the Rhine. And they're very different colors. And you can mm -hmm. kind of see like one's very sort of turquoisey and one's kind of, you know, milky. And there was something about seeing the two of them come together, but keep their integrity intact that they were coming together but the two colors weren't completely meshing you know and and something about that just really struck me in that moment that like i need better boundaries <laughs> i need to have my own you know sense of integrity and my sense of safety and that i really didn't and that i was just very wide open to you know the world and to everything and that was a big shift actually in my in my mind and it was because of that you know the i guess mm -hmm. that immersive experience like yes, you said that totally. i was able to get that in a way that i never had before mm -hmm. and i never put that together until just now no oh, that's marvelous <laughs> i love it yeah <laughs> that's pretty yeah that's pretty profound i mean i think you're like diving into dual and non-dual, right? So your experience was of that and like what do you make of it? Um, and I think also when we are in a state of shock like that, maybe we're also perceive things more clearly. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I know what you mean about those two rivers and it is, it's beautiful. And I couldn't think of a better way of, you know, describing that um, aspect, you know, of, of duality while still retaining individuality. I think that's what we struggle with in the world at the moment so much is, you know, we had this great movement, that globalism and all the rest of that. And, and I love that, quite frankly. I mean, you know, it's sort of my, my heritage, how I grew up moving around, but... Mm -hmm. In that, I think we kind of forgot about the individual cultures and and the richness of that. Although I don't feel like I did, but <laughs> somehow it started, you know, getting watered down. And um, so, yeah, so now it's coming back. It's like saying individuality is super important, but it's almost like in a certain way, the pendulum has swung so far to the other side that it's just individuality, which is also not where it's at. Yeah. So it's kind of like what you mentioned where, you know, the two rivers converge and yet both, you know, still hold their individuality within that. Mm -hmm. And yet they become one. I one. Mean, you know, yeah. it's, like, it's, a, it's beautiful, very poetic. Wow. I'm glad you donked that guy in the head. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did go to the police after afterward too, and they were no help at all. But I'm really glad I I bonked him one, <laughs> meted out immediate justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's a great analogy. Great analogy. We need a picture of that. Yeah, yeah. I need to find a a good picture For of those, that. Yeah, those come together. Yeah, maybe I'll put that on the, the show notes. Yeah, because, you know, I think there aren't that many rivers where it's so clear that these are two different rivers with two different sediments and two mm -hmm. different characteristics that are like really coming together. And what does that look like? It's the coolest. Yeah, I think I had really sort of taken it for granted before that moment. And it really struck me right then as as being really profound. <laughs> Yeah. So very immersive. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think blocks people from recognizing this wholeness of, you know, humanity? Automatic thinking. And, you know, there's also an aspect of um, 
of it that uh, you know i think a lot of people are, don't have the luxury maybe to have these types of conversations always and, you know they're just trying to make ends meet especially at the moment yeah um so yeah i i think then survival is something that is an issue but i think it's also that our societies in general value survival so much i mean that sounds so weird but <laughs> truthfully um it's like wow you know that person made it like okay they they survived really well um and then there's money attached to that um Oh boy, is there? That, yeah, well, you know, I mean, the way we we deal with it in, in our societies kind of is, right? So that's the way we kind of define it. Like, um, and yet there's an element there where diving deeper, um, we could we could come out of <laughs> the experience of life by not having this survival entrenched thinking because it puts the system out of balance. Mm -hmm. So any uh, self-emergent system or any emergent system has its own um, balance it's just the way nature works I mean you know so you put something in imbalance and it will just look to get back into balance you know uh, on its own uh, homeostasis is what it's called I mean in biology you have to study this um, and I think that when we overuse or overdrive or over survive over others we're putting the system out of balance and then what we get is a swift kick in the butt which we haven't quite realized that that's what it is and it's actually not necessary which is the irony of it so <laughs> we're all like grambling and um and yet it's not helping us because we're constantly creating chaos. Well, there's always chaos, but you know, there's within that chaos, there is a homeostasis that we are not aware of because we're not controlling it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that simplicity strikes again, right? So it's like this, oh yeah, <laughs> um, it's so simple. And yet then there's the complexity at the core of that but yeah again a long answer sorry <laughs> i love it i love your long answers it's great so it's about the time when i usually do uh this little exercise and i'm very curious to see how this goes with okay. you okay <laughs> so what i'd like you to do if you don't mind is close your eyes for a moment and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to wave my magic wand and suddenly everything is as it should be you are now living in a utopia where everyone is aware, awake, they are conscious, they are in the, in the present, in the moment. And I want you to just look around and tell me what you see and what you hear, what you're experiencing in this reality. <laughs> you know, it was so funny, the first thought that occurred to me, oh, there's nothing left to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> My work here is done. Um, so what are you going to do? Go to Disneyland? Take a nap? Wow, I'm like, Shh, Disneyland, sure. <laughs> so fun. I love fun. Like you mentioned, you know, um, games and playing. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd probably spend my time playing and doing art and, you know, trying to write poetry about something that, you know, I remember suffering about. <laughs> 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 or, or, um, you know, or just beauty then. It's just, yeah. it, and I guess, you know, um, that's a great point. Then there's nothing left but play. Yeah. Um, so what do you see when you think of everyone's playing? What do you, what do you see? It's just fun. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I almost feel like my life is going more and more in that direction. I want it to continue that way. <laughs> um, what else? Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a fostering of, of happiness and, and yeah. sort of, you know, like I mentioned, like this individuality that is respected and interesting. And so maybe, maybe my work wouldn't be done or, you know, I'd feel because there's so much to discover in, in, mm -hmm. in this individual um, essence of, of everyone and it's exchange and these differences. And yeah, because um, now you're surrounded by aware creators, right? right? Who are creating new ways to play and collaborate and yeah, imagine they're all around a big pot and everybody is like I have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and let's create a little bit of this this <laughs> like the VR this and that and then we put people in it and then oh crap we have a world <laughs> oh I think that we need a little bit of action so how about we create a war and then we take off and we make it like that one area doesn't have very much and another area has a lot. And then we see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. That could be the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. So maybe, you know, there, there are a lot of those games, the board games. Um, and I do like, I enjoy playing board games as well um that are are really awesome i mean um there's some that that are um uh, educational like the um the one that recreates the pandemic there's a really cool one so then you get to you know play with that which is also that experience so imagine playing all day long but you also have like the settlers of Catan where you are like, you know, you have different areas and different people are settling in different ways. And there are areas of desert where it's not going well. And there are areas where there's the cities and, you know, the problem solving is around, mm -hmm. I guess, how do I win? So that's no longer, you know, that cooperative um, kind of yeah, scenario what's the... we we're talking about. Because challenge, I mean, obviously in play, there's there's always challenge, right? Challenge yeah. is inherent to to the idea of play. Exactly. But how do we separate challenge from struggle? Kind of like separating pain from suffering. How do you begin to do that? Yeah. Oh. Well, by transpersonal psychology, suffering is, you know, it's, it's the way um, to grow. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, how do we separate it out? You don't. And like you said, the moment you hit utopia, that's why that big sense of boredom overcame me. <laughs> like, you know, so <laughs> everything's perfect. There's no more, there's no more, you know, you don't meet blocks anymore. Um, what I find interesting is, is um, there, I forget the name of the board game. Pen, pen, I think it's called pandemic. Um, and it's a cooperative game. But then you have, you know, you're fighting the pandemic. So right. there's like, there's still like this idea of struggle. And, and maybe that's kind of a great way of answering your question because, um, you know, although there's suffering there, there's not so much of, well, there is a struggle, but it's like, it's not against each other. Mm -hmm. It's more finding a way to cooperate so as to... Uh, overcome an obstacle yeah and yeah. i think maybe that that's the way a lot of times we don't look at suffering that way and we try to escape it at all costs mm -hmm. um which is a lot of times worse than if um you know we were to engage in it um but yeah so maybe that that ease it's not an ease necessarily but you know that shift of looking at it that reframe that it's you know just an invitation to solve something else together yeah i mean that's yeah. pretty utopia like we're pretty there i think right? i think so yeah and again i think some people are and some yeah. people are not because of how they're viewing things right 
some people view it as, well, here's some very productive pain that I'm, you know, working through. Uh, other people see it as, oh, this unbearable suffering that, you know, is happening to me and I can do nothing about it. And, but maybe there's elements of both, right? Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes as we go through something that is really difficult, we go through those phases where we hit rock bottom and it oh, feels yeah. like, oh my God, you know? Yeah. And sometimes, then sometimes yeah. we hit them all, you know, five times in one day. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Well, at the moment it's yeah, we're last... rife with it here in the U S um, there was a lot of crying last night. There was a lot yeah. Of crying. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I mean, you know, for, for all sides, really like this is, yeah. again, this is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So like this sense of one side, not understanding the other and, mm -hmm. And fear, it, just so much fear, fear on both sides. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, it's like we're from different planets, <laughs> which is fascinating anyway. So, yeah, so I think it's- Republicans uh, are from Mars, Democrats are from Venus or something. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, God. Uh, I don't even know if, well, we should, that would be great on a questionnaire. Yeah. How do you define yourself? You know, what planet are you from? If you ever, <laughs> anyways, uh, there's a researcher at work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. I I'm just going to ask one more question, which yeah. is what do you think is the main message or takeaway for people listening today? Oh, wow. <laughs> You know, I almost don't want to say, you know, what, whatever has um, resonated. Um, it's so funny. I, You're the first person to ever say that. And I've always been waiting for someone to say like, yeah. oh, that's, that's for them to figure out. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm <laughs> like, cause we've been talking about this, right? So everybody is bringing in their individual gifts, their individual worldview. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you know, that's like, okay, there's the culture and then there's a subculture and then there's a sub subculture and then there is you as an individual. But so I'm sure that certain people would agree on certain things like resonating more. Mm -hmm. And yet I think for every individual, there'll be a little nugget there of interest. Yeah, absolutely. At least that's my hope. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. So where can people find you? Um. <laughs> Great question. Um, well, I I have a website, dorotelucci.com. So that's a really easy one. And from there, there's a link to the virtual reality work that I do, um, which is has the name of Core Reboot. So there's a website called corereboot.com as well. And then you can find me under Sophia University, which is then um, for teaching. And... Um, research also on dorotelucci.com and if anybody's interested in participating in research shoot me an email dorotelucci at gmail.com and yes i think that's it that's where you can find me so so many so many things so many good things to do that's awesome thank you so much and i would love to participate in research that sounds wonderful okay Right. <laughs> Thanks so much I'd for love being to here. Have you? Yes, yeah. I'm in. <laughs>